Today, we're taking a 2012 Tundra and improving its looks and ground clearance by adding a 4-inch lift. Then we're upgrading the brakes both front and rear. Then we'll add bigger, but more importantly, not heavier wheels and tires, all to give this truck the right look and stance. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Yeah, I have to let Ryan help every once in a while or he gets his feelings hurt. Hey, you're watching Truck Tech. Today, we're going to be working on a really popular full-size four-wheel drive truck platform and showing you how to customize it with a four and a half inch lift. Now, this one is owned by a buddy of ours, Hank, and it's already got a leveling kit on it so he can run some 33 inch tires. But he wants to make this four-wheel drive Platinum Edition Tundra a little bit taller so he can run some even larger wheels and tires. Now, before we get to work, we wanted to take a minute to welcome you to the new shop. And we're still here to help you guys solve problems on your rig, whether it's a lowered street truck, a dual purpose on off road rig, a custom classic, or a big old towing diesel. That's right. We're bringing you great tools, tips, and techniques, and sharing our experience and insight in topics such as drivetrains, suspensions, electronics, bodywork, and paint. But enough chit chat. We got work to do. Now, the four and a half inches of lift from this BDS system come in part from these giant replacement cast knuckles that work in concert with the factory hubs, as well as these strut extensions which clamp to the OE struts and give the lift that matches the knuckles. Now, one thing that is better than the OE system for sure is this skid plate, which replaces the sheet metal plate that arguably may guard you against a furry mammal that meets its unfortunate fate on some roadside somewhere, whereas this plate may actually deflect some kind of an obstacle like a rock or a tree stump if you do take your Tundra off-road. Now, what I'm calling the heart of the system are these two cross members that bolt into the factory locations and effectively relocate your lower control arms, completing the BDS front suspension system. Now, at back, We've got these extended length Fox shocks that replace the OEs, as well as some mounting plates, new U-bolts, and the lift blocks that level out and balance out the lift. The only thing that's really not a bolt-in on this truck are these plates that come with the kit, and they cap off the cross member that you've got to remove to drop everything down. Now with our big old truck upon our big old lift, we can blow the independent front suspension apart. With the main parts being the brakes, strut assemblies, lower control arms, and the piece you don't want to drop, the front axle assembly. All right, good. All right, and slowly down. Now to install the replacement drop cross member, we've got to get rid of this factory cross member, which is welded into place, which means we've got a couple of cuts to make. Now they recommend you use a reciprocating saw to get the job done, but if you've got an angle grinder and a cutoff wheel, we can probably get to the back side and the front side to make your cut. If you move some parts around, you can probably get to the top as well. Or you can use a cutting torch or a plasma cutter. Whatever works for you. Just try to make a nice, clean cut. And with the cross member finally out of the way, we can grind down where we made the cut so this fill plate fits nice and flush. And just weld it into place. Now, this isn't a structural weld, so it's just a cosmetic thing. You can just grind down the weld to make them look nice if you want to. And Hit it with a coat of paint to keep corrosion at bay. Then we can move on to installing the front drop cross member. Bolts in place with the provided hardware. Then you get to wrestle the front axle back into position. Now this axle mount needs to be grind down and modified for a little bit of clearance. Nothing a four and a half inch angle grinder and an 80 grit flap wheel can't take care of and then bolt it in place using OE hardware. Leave it loose for now so it can be positioned where it needs to be. Then the rear drop cross member gets installed. Now using a pry bar and my shoulder, I was able to position the front axle where I wanted it. Then I was able to tighten down the hardware to make sure it stays put. And don't forget your front drive shaft, or else your four-wheel drive truck is going to be a two-wheel drive one. Done. 
Next, we can reinstall the factory lower control arms, leaving the bolts loose for now so we can make adjustments later. Then you can also go ahead and final tighten all the front axle and drop subframe. Now to keep the tires from getting into the suspension, we're going to weld on a steering stop extension. Our Miller 252 makes quick work of it. Then the factory bump stops get removed and replaced with a drop bracket and a bump stop supplied in the kit. Now this piece of steel not only acts as a skid plate, but it also adds some rigidity by tying the drop cross members together. And that just about finishes up the front suspension on this truck. Out back, well, shock installation sometimes seems simple, but sometimes takes an extra set of hands. The bush and everything on? Yep. I have to let Ryan help every once in a while or he gets his feelings hurt. And with the shocks installed, we can add the new rear lift lock and secure them with the supplied U-bolts. When we come back, we'll get the front suspension all buttoned up. And later, it's all new brakes on all four corners. Get the outside pad started first. Stick around. All right, now before we go any farther, we've got to do some work to the steering knuckle and the factory strut assembly. On the steering knuckle, we've got to swap over the hub or wheel bearing and the dust shield. And on the strut, well, we've got to remove the previously installed leveling kit and add some strut extenders. Now the first thing we need to do is loosen up and remove the four bolts holding the wheel bearing assembly to the knuckle. Then remove the brake dust shield and the seal on the back side of the knuckle. Now this seal does get reused, so you don't want to damage it in the removal and swap over process. After carefully tapping the seal back in place, you can add the brake dust shield, making sure it's indexed correctly. Or else you're never gonna get that brake caliper on. Now, if your truck has a ton of miles on it, now may be a good time to replace the wheel bearing or hub assembly. Ours is low mileage and can get reused. All right. All right, now whatever you do, do not remove this strut retaining nut. If you do, you might have just made a little portable rocket launcher. Now the good thing about bolt-on modifications is most of the time they're easily reversible. We're simply removing the spacer that was providing the lift up front and we're back to stock. And we're back to stock. Keep these, use them for reinstallation. First, strut extender. Now we're using a rubber mallet to kind of persuade the strut extender over the stock strut. It uses a large bolt that goes through the original shock or strut eyelet and then two smaller bolts with sleeves that pinch the shock tube and locate the strut extender. Before we install our extended length strut assembly, we're installing the new knuckle by hanging it from the upper control arm so it can carry the weight while we attach everything else to it. Now, this tie rod is going to get replaced with one provided in the kit. And don't forget which way the strut is supposed to be indexed when installing it. Just like with the knuckle, we're installing it, tightening up a few threads and letting it hang by the weight and then securing the bottom. Now the strut gets attached to the lower control arm with the factory hardware. Just using a screwdriver to line up the eyelet so the bolt can pass through. 
and we're also using factory hardware to attach the lower ball joint holder to the knuckle assembly. And just like Toyota did, we used a little bit of Loctite on the bolts before tightening them up. Then we can start tightening down the axle retaining nut. Now to do that, we're using a little homebrew socket and a Matco impact gun running wide open. And normally we just speed this stuff up to get it done. But we wanted to show you how much effort it takes to draw the splined axle shaft into the hub. Now keep in mind, we've got some anti-seize slathered on the splines of both parts to ease assembly. It just takes a lot of force. But you want to make sure it's fully seated so the seal works and no dirt and grime gets in there. And that should do it. Sway bar end links are getting replaced with longer extended sway bar end links provided in the kit. To finish things up front, we're installing the provided tie rod ends and securing them to the knuckle. And don't forget the cotter pin. After the break, we're adding some bigger but not necessarily heavier wheels and tires. Stay tuned. Original equipment wheels need to go through an intense amount of testing in order to be certified to go on a mass-produced vehicle. That means they're ridiculously strong. Ridiculously strong usually means ridiculously heavy. Well, let's test out this 20-inch wheel and tire combo that came off the Tundra and see what it weighs. All right, we're at 107 pounds. Now, the reason... We're even installing a lift system is to go with a larger set of wheel and tire. And larger usually means heavier. This is the wheel and tire combo that we're putting on this truck. These are from Dick's CPEC. It's a 35 by 125020 with a Mud Country <coughs> tire, a nice tread pattern, more aggressive lugs, bigger. Let's see what this one weighs. Okay. Now we're right at 105 pounds with this one. And you'd think going two inches larger in overall diameter with a lot more tread because the other tires are worn out and a lot more aggressive tread pattern with a beefier looking wheel, well, you'd be adding weight. Well, we're not, we're losing weight. It's only two pounds per corner. But look at it this way. It's not the weight that you're shaving. It's the weight that you're not adding on in the first place. So this actually makes a lot of sense. Now with a truck this big and sitting on heavy rolling stock, well, an upgrade in the brake department is always a good idea. So we're throwing on some yellow stuff EBC brake pads and some dimpled and slotted rotors. The brake pad changes on these style calipers are a piece of cake. Okay. First, remove the retaining clip or spring, then slide the pad pins out. Make sure you don't lose this little spring here in the middle. Then simply pull the pads out. Get the outside pad started first. Now since we're dealing with a four piston caliper, two on each side, it's gonna take two tools to depress the pistons on the inside to make enough room for the brake pad. If you try to do it with one tool, you're gonna be playing a game of whack-a-mole with the caliper pistons. And with the pads installed, make sure you don't forget the small pieces of hardware that finish off the job. With the brake pad retaining pins fully inserted, don't forget the retaining clip that makes sure they don't walk out of the caliper. And make sure the little spring clip in between the pads is seated in the pads. All right, now all we gotta do is reattach our ABS sensor, reattach the brake lines to the new knuckle, and attach the brake lines to the frame using this extension bracket. Then we'll have the front of this thing just about wrapped up. Out back, the lift blocks and the suspension into full droop put a little bit of extra pressure on the brake line. So we're relieving that pressure by flipping the lower mounts onto the axle and installing the extension brackets that are provided in the lift system. They also provide the hardware for this, making it even easier. Now obviously we're upgrading the brakes on all four corners and out back, the calipers come off easily. 
But if you're in a northern climate or your truck is old and rusty, sometimes removing the rear rotors can be a bit of a challenge. Well, here's a cool thing that Toyota has integrated into their rotor hats. You can take these two threaded bosses and run in some bolts, evenly applying pressure and slowly walking the rotor off of the axle flange, no matter how stuck or how rusty it is. Thanks, Toyota. This makes it easier. Now, obviously, the EBC rotor pops right on, and we got lucky didn't have to adjust the e-brake shoes on the inside. The yellow stuff pads slip into the caliper and it slips back on the rotor hat. It's pretty straightforward. Now the brake system out back is simpler and smaller, but the truth is the front system does most of the work. Hey, welcome back to Truck Tech, where we're wrapping up the suspension lift of our 2012 Toyota Tundra. Now the icing on the cake is improving the form and increasing the function with our new set of wheels and tires. All right, now with the truck down on all fours, we do the typical routine of tightening down all the suspension hardware we had to hold off on until the weight was on the vehicle. Plus we've installed our new wheels and torqued down the lug nuts. And guys, remember it's a good practice after you've driven a couple of hundred miles on a new set of wheels to retorque the lug nuts and make sure everything's still good and tight. And here's another thing to consider. Remember that when you go up in overall tire diameter like we did, well, you change the gear ratio of the vehicle. So it may be a really good idea to change to lower gears in your front and rear differentials. That way, when you're on the highway, your vehicle's not going to be constantly hunting for the right gear and your transmission's going to live a much happier life overall. One thing's for sure, though, we've dramatically improved and changed the looks and the stance of this truck, in our opinion, for the better. Now we all know Bully Dog is a leading manufacturer in power programmers and now they've got the GT Tuner for Toyota platforms and it does what you've come to expect out of programmers build power but a whole lot more. Check it out. The GT T Plus has features like data logging and the fun drag strip feature but it also allows you to monitor up to 15 different functions from the vehicle's computer and you can tap into some of the OE features like your power windows, your dome light controls and create audible alerts so not only can you see the gauges function you can tell by hearing when the warning lights are coming on. The GT T Plus works with 4Runner, Tacoma, Sequoia and Tundra and comes with a pretty interesting money back guarantee that you could learn about from BullyDog.com. Check them out. Now if you're the owner of a second generation Toyota Tundra and you want to improve the exhaust note coming from the 5.7 liter V8, well check out this MagnaFlow exhaust system. It features a fully stainless steel 2 into 1 muffler, 2 and a half inch inlet piping, 3 inch outlet piping and a nice 4 inch fully polished stainless steel tip. And with it being fully stainless, well, it should outlast the truck that you're putting it on. And with the muffler's straight through design and the large diameter mandrel bent tubing, well, it'll help improve airflow, which is going to help you make more power. And who doesn't want that? Plus, it's going to sound a lot better than stock. Now, even if your paint is in great shape, today's environment can be very hazardous to that finish. So Mother's Clay Bar system is a great way to deep clean your paint surface. The process starts using the instant detailer on the panels as a lubricant. Then the clay bar removes and lifts contaminants out of the paint using a shearing action. Once you're done cleaning, then you can wipe up with a microfiber towel that's included in the kit. Now once you're done deep cleaning with the clay bar system, you can follow up with your favorite mother's California gold detailing products and give your vehicle the deep clean super detail that it deserves. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.